Yes, we are live now. Hello, everyone. The White Army is blessed to have Professor Y.K. Amdekar, sir, as our today's mentor. Sir is a medical director of Vardia Hospital of Mumbai. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. And Mr. Melvin Mebin, fourth year MBBS student from Asan Institute of Medical Science, as volunteer to present a clinical case of lower respiratory tract infection. Welcome to you, sir. I also welcome all the active members to the session. With the permission of Professor Y.K. Amdekar, sir, let's begin the presentation. Over to you, Melvin, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, shall we begin? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so today's case, uh, we have a two-year-old male patient named XYZ, hails from Alur Hassan. The informant is the mother, who is educated up to class 10. It, uh, it is a reliable history. They belong to class 3 of modified BG Prasad classification. Uh, the baby was admitted on 12th March 2020 and examined on 15th March 2020. The chief complaints are cough since 6 days, fever since 6 days and hurried breathing since 3 days. History of presenting illness. Uh, the patient was apparently alright 6 days back. Then he developed cough which was insidious in onset. There are no aggravating or relieving factors for the cough. There is no positional or diurnal, diurnal variation. Uh, there is also a history of fever since four days, which is uh, sudden in onset, present throughout the day, high grade, not associated with chills and rigors, not associated with rashes, and there are no aggravating or relieving factors. Uh, there is also a history of hurried breathing since three days, it is insidious in onset, progressive in nature. There's also history of grunting sounds. Uh, there is history of irritability, excessive crying, and decreased food intake since one week. No history of chest pain or wheeze. No history of running nose, ear pain, or ear discharge. No history of hoarseness of voice. No history of vomiting or diarrhea. No history of daytime sleepiness, altered sensorium or convulsions. No history of pain during maturation, no history of contact with the TB patient or anyone suffering from chronic cough. Past history, uh, there was a similar episode eight months ago. Child was admitted into the hospital for one week with complaints of cough and fever with hurried breathing. He was cured completely and was discharged. There is no history of bronchial asthma or any other illnesses in the child. Family history, uh, no history of uh, similar complaints in any of the family members, no history of uh, tuberculosis in any of the family members, and he is the only child of his parents. Antenatal history, uh, there is no significant antenatal history. It was all right. uh, un uneventful. Natal history, uh, he was delivered at government hospital, full-term normal delivery, and there were no complications at birth. Neonatal history, uh, breastfeed was initiated soon after birth and it continued till six months. And uh, no prelactyl feeds were used and passed meconium and to a urine within 24 hours. And there is no history of NICU admission. Uh, diet history, a complementary feeding was started at six months of age. His diet is deficient in 530 calories and 4.6 uh, grams of protein. Developmental history, uh, all the uh, developmental milestones are achieved normally. I immunization history. Yeah, immunization. Uh, the child is immunized uh, till date. Socioeconomic history, they belong to class three of modified BG Prasad classification, three members in the family. Live in a Paka house. Yes. Will we uh, summary of yeah, we are, yes. don't give a summary so far. Uh, get okay. to the first slide. Get to the first yes. slide. And let's start discussing what we understand out of each slide and then take the matter further on uh, examination. Now, yes, the, uh, get to the next slide. Yes. Yeah. Now, what do you understand of this sequence? The child starts with cough, two days later starts with fever, and a day after fever started, starts with hurried breathing. 
what do you make out of this sequence of events cough first fever thereafter and lastly hurried breathing i will i will give you a clue if you yes. were the doctor in the first two days of this child's illness there was no fever nor there was any hurried breathing the only yes. symptom was cough yes. where is the anatomy of this child's illness melvin can you yes sir come on the video sure put on your video that's fine good yeah. so uh, tell me where is the anatomy of this illness uh, respiratory tract respiratory very good now how are you sure it's not a cardiac condition they also have a it, cough right it, 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 yes sir it could be either respiratory or cardiac condition all right so between the two what do you think it must be the possible system involved see i i want you to start thinking in terms of four elements of diagnosis first anatomy we must know where is the disease without which we cannot proceed further the next is we must know the pathology of the disease which means what is the type of disease once we know the anatomy and pathology we will guess the etiology which means the cause of the problem and lastly we will decide whether the given system or an organ is working well or almost impending failure or almost in failure so in that sequence who will guess any students who want to guess whether it's a respiratory so, or a cardiac a respiratory condition. respiratory complaint because usually in cardiac conditions uh, breathlessness precedes the cough very good so if it's an acute condition breathlessness would have been the symptom okay however if there was a chronic heart disease like a congenital heart disease then possibly you can also have a cough but you are right okay so now we come to a conclusion that this is mostly a respiratory disease now do you think this is uh, which part of the respiratory system is involved again i'll give you a clue for a clinician the respiratory system is divided into airways lung parenchyma interstitium and pleura one could add one more as a mediastinum but mediastinal problem again go through mostly the airway so which part of the respiratory system is involved do you think it's an airway or a lung parenchyma or a pleura or the interstitium any any students on the chat make a guess work parenchyma oh parenchyma all right even the on the chat tushar says is parenchyma now tell me why did you think it was parenchyma we are discussing only the cough we are not aware of fever we are not aware of hurried breathing so do you have any so, reason airway yes. diseases will have uh, difficulty in breathing as the chief complaint why should that have for example a uh, pharynx is an airway i have a pharyngitis i have no difficulty in breathing yeah now on the chat <clears throat> airway disease always starts with cough okay so what is the peculiarity of an airway a cough is a significant symptom whereas if it's a lung parenchyma there would be a cough but a cough is a minor symptom so my next question when you see a child with cough is to find out how severe is the symptom of cough you get the point that is very important we believe that this has started with a cough so it must be the major symptom and so we will consider it as an airway disease so always ask the details of cough one is how severe it is very good uh, tushar is saying that if is the cough disturbing sleep or how severe it is yes but first is is it a major symptom and if it's a major symptom the micro anatomy 
of the respiratory tract is airway. Again, uh, you have a pleuritic pain uh, as a typical story of a pleural involvement. Sure. Yeah. Okay, but in a two-year-old child, the pain is not easy to even complain of. But because somebody on the chat said pleural pain, yes, you are right. My question is, does a child of pneumonia also can have a chest pain? Yeah, she can have. Yes, loudly, Melvin? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Why, why should the lung parenchyma give you pain? Because lung parenchyma does not have any nerve endings. So lung parenchymal diseases do not have pain. You have two things in the body which have no pain receptor. One is lung parenchyma and another is the brain cells. The brain cells have no nerve ending. Now, uh, somebody is rightly saying complicated pneumonia, but not really true. What I want to go is that Plural irritation with pneumonia. Yeah, somebody on the chat says plural irritation, and the correct answer is histopathologically, many pneumonias are pleuro pneumonias, which means pleura is also involved, but the involvement is not a major issue. Therefore, many times there is no chest pain, but it could be a major issue in a pneumonia. And the point is, even pneumonia may start with the chest pain. Of course, the pleural involvement has to be there in a pneumonia when you have a chest pain. So coming back to my airway question. So this child looks to have a primary airway disease. Now, once we are sure that it's a severe cough and therefore the airway, my next question to you is, is it upper airway or a lower airway? Lower airway disease. Why do you say so? Give me a reason why you said lower airway. You may be right. So what is the basic difference between upper airway and lower airway? Very good. So uh, I think Sharmila says that lower airway has a wet cough and upper airway has a dry cough. Okay. So Next question in every cough is, is it a wet cough or a dry cough? Now, in a small child of two-year-old, the wet cough is not given by parents as an expectoration. Whereas in an adult, you classically talk about expectoration. Yeah. If there is a post-nasal drip, on the chat, there is a question, the answer is post-nasal drip. Post-nasal drip causes irritation of an upper airway and causes a dry cough. Whereas, if this is a wet cough, it's a lower airway involvement. If it's an upper airway, it's a dry cough. Now, go one bit further on this. If it's an upper airway, is it pharynx or larynx? How do you so differentiate far. with... Yeah? Pharynx, uh, because based on the voice of the child. Very good. So you feel that larynx should have had some hoarseness of voice and yes. you did give a negative history that there was no hoarseness. But remember one thing, pharynx do not have any cough receptors. Pharynx does not have a cough receptor. So isolated pharyngitis should have no cough. And therefore, if it is a bacterial pharyngitis, like a typical pharyngotonsillitis, then cough is not a symptom. Difficulty in swallowing or painful swallowing is a symptom. But in a viral pharyngitis, it's not the pharynx alone, but the entire respiratory system or airway may be involved. And therefore they cough. So when you see pharyngitis, one could differentiate bacterial from viral. A bacterial pharyngitis has no cough because the pharynx does not have cough receptors. But larynx has. So go further. Do you know, Melvin, whether this cough was wet cough or a dry cough? 
uh, couldn't elicit that because the child was very uh, small, All six right. years old. So, uh, yes, somebody on the chat says there could be a croup. Uh, yes. So, there could be a strider laryngitis. Yes. But we have taken a note that let's believe that this child has got a cough as a significant symptom and it is a wet cough. Therefore, it is a lower airway involved. Now, lower airway is right from trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, is all airway. Now, yes. can we differentiate between these three elements, whether it is a bronchi or a bronchioles? Isolated tracheitis is not common. Okay, so a lower airway, more the breathlessness. Very good. I think. Tushar is again saying that if it's a bronchiolitis, let's call it as a distal lower airway, as against a proximal lower airway, which is bronchi. So as you go down the airway from bronchi to bronchioles, the cough intensity goes down and the tachypnea starts coming up. So bronchitis coughs a lot. Bronchiolitis may not even cough or has a very mild cough. And that's how if this child is coughing, then this child must be having a bronchial involvement. See how a history alone can make a microanatomical diagnosis. Not only respiratory system, further airways, not only airways, lower airways. And now we know lower proximal lower airways, which means bronchi. So bronchi are involved in this child. That much we knew. Okay. Now he yeah. starts getting fever. Now, yeah. whenever a fever comes two days after the first symptom, the primary infection is unlikely. Infection mostly start primarily with fever. But this child started with cough alone and there was no fever, which means that fever has come later. If fever has come later, it could mean that there is some complication occurring and maybe the process is now getting infected. So okay. take a note of this. So what would you ask the parent? You would have made sure that there was no fever at all to begin with. So okay. you would have asked the mother whether there was a mild fever. If not, she may not have detected it. You could have asked whether child looks sick, whether the child lost appetite, whether the child showed any evidence of a mild fever. But obviously, let's believe that this was no fever and the fever came later as a high fever. Point I'm making is the sequence are very important. If yes. this child has a respiratory infection primarily, then it should have started with fever as the first symptom, mm -hmm. along with cough maybe. But if this child did not have fever for first two days, then I would imagine it started without infection, but got infected down the line somewhere. You get the point clearly. Yes, sir. Yes. So let's take further. Now we develop fever, and within one day of having developed fever, he starts getting hurried breathing. What does it mean yes. to you? It's uh, getting worse. Okay. So uh, on the chat, it says virulent infection. All right. It could be, but which now which part is involved? Do you think now the infection is involving only the bronchi or it has gone to the lung parenchyma? That's what we need to guess. So who will make that guess? So we believe that, oh, now parenchyma, all right. So why do you think now it is parenchyma? Why don't you think it is still an infection in the bronchi only. You get my point? Yes. Sir. Breathlessness. All right. So, the generally a bacterial bronchitis 
may not be breathless and if this child has started breathlessness it's likely that some pneumonia is getting formed so now you have a story of a child who starts with cough alone so let's make it as a non infective bronchitis it's bronchial involvement but non infective and now it is getting infected and coming with pneumonia okay so that's what the first slide itself tells us that now yeah. go to the next slide and now we have the story of fever for four days high fever okay yeah. now i'm sure all students mention whether there were chill or rigor tell me what is chill and what is rigor the the feeling of that the cold feeling is the chills and the rigor is when there is shivering all right okay any anybody from the chat giving me a little more clarity on what is chill and what is rigor so chill is a peripheral vasoconstriction so as to retain heat so the body system knows that you have to increase body temperature to fight an infection so the first process of raising body temperature is to stop the evaporation of the heat so the heat should be retained not allowed to leave the body how do you do that peripheral vasoconstriction how how does the patient feel he feels a bit cold he feels chilly and how does the doctor know that when the doctor puts his hand over the lower part of the feet or the hands the feet and hands are cold but the abdomen and the chest skin is warm so there is a peripheral vasoconstriction so next time when you examine a child with fever you put your hand on the foot and check the abdomen skin and if the feet are cold and the abdomen is warm you know that he is having a high fever peripheral vasoconstriction and somebody on the chat already said that rigor is an active muscle contraction that's what you said shivering what does why does the shivering occur because when you shiver and there is an active muscle contraction the heat is generated so when do you, when does the body need to generate heat when the fever has to rise very very high and mere peripheral vasoconstriction retaining heat is not enough to throw the temperature even higher you need to have a muscle contraction so if there is no chill or no rigor it probably means that the fever may not be very high we cannot quantify but it gives you an idea how high the fever could be but here the fever has been there for four days so yes, obviously it means that infection has set in and possibly waiting for the right treatment to come under control so so far so good get to the next slide please sir uh, in the two year old can we like differentiate the wet cough and dry cough yes very good question uh, the way you differentiate is we ask the parents whether the mother finds that the chest is making noise you know so the mothers are able to say that the chest appears full making noises and i am sure it's not easy every time to be sure wet or a dry cough but there is a small difference of every mother notices it very well and she would say that oh there is a lot of uh, movements occurring in the chest or a noise and that's how uh, 
somebody in the chat is saying post stressive vomiting well post stressive vomiting happens after any severe cough it could be a dry cough or a wet cough but is more often after a dry cough but it could happen after a wet cough also but i'll give you a typical example of how even an adult the apparent wet cough may not appear to be with expectoration for example an adult has a bronchial asthma or my elderly child has a bronchial asthma and the bronchi are into spasm there are secretions in the bronchi it's a wet cough but because of the bronchospasm the child cannot expectorate how does a asthmatic cough he starts coughing it appears dry but then at the end of that severe bout of cough he is able to expectorate so he will say <coughs> so he will have a cough so most of the parents would know that the chest is looking heavy or filled with cough that is how but you raised a very pertinent question it's not easy every time to know wet cough or a high cough now subsequently uh, we have no obvious aggravating factors so go go next slide yeah. yes we have already said now tell me uh, what does grunting mean now first melvin tell me how did you ask the mother whether there is grunting so whether there was any uh, noisy breathing sounds made while the child was breathing okay but would you would you demonstrate to me uh, what is grunting you try to grunt and show me what is grunting can you do that uh, noise is right i will show you that so it's not easy for a mother to know grunting in fact grunting is a colloquial english word and we keep on grunting even for nothing we know that but yes. what is grunting grunting is an attempt by the body to increase the peak end expiratory pressure p double e p how does the child grunt oh 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 that is grunting when i do this oh, i am trying to keep my alveoli open for a better gaseous exchange what does it mean it's almost a uh, indicative of a probable hardening of a lung which has to be kept open alveoli have to be kept open and they are hardening that means it's pneumonia so grunting almost denotes pneumonia and the way you grunt is uh, uh, uh. this is grunting right difficult to make out only by the history but yes you can demonstrate to the mother and ask whether she has observed like this fine now you also said that there is a history of irritability excessive crying why is he irritable and why is he crying any any idea but your history is very good you have even asked me minor points but what does it mean to us so we have already talked about a respiratory disease we are talking about a child getting infected we are talking about pneumonia but now tell me why should a child of pneumonia be irritable so what is irritability i'm sure if i go on asking you difficult questions you will be irritable okay so where is the anatomy of oh very good somebody on the chat says cns involvement so do you mean it is meningitis now what is cns involvement good good thought would you come back on the chat and say what kind of cns involvement meningitis all right but good thought uh, what i want you to know is that it's very rare for a localized infection like pneumonia to spread to the other parts the very fact that the child has been able to localize infection in one area the immune system is working well to contain the disease only in one area 
and therefore it is very rare for a child of pneumonia to get into meningitis as a complication but what irritability means is two things irritability is pain the commonest cause of irritability is pain in a child a child cannot localize pain it's only beyond 4 or 5 years of age that the child can localize pain till then pain anywhere in the body the child would be crying and will be irritable so could this be an evidence of a plural pain but generally a child will plural pain will not prefer to cry because when he cries he is taking a deep breath and the deep breath will hurt him more so he will avoid crying in fact a typical older child or an adult has a shallow breathing and he tries to restrict the depth of breath because it hurts when two pleural surfaces brush against each other so irritability commonly is pain but irritability could also mean cerebral irritation not meningitis alone but cerebral irritation now when brain cells are irritable the reason could be metabolic or infective yes but we said this is unlikely to be infection so this could be metabolic now what is what is the metabolic problems in a child with a pneumonia can you have any metabolic issues coming up because of pneumonia yes and the answer is the child of pneumonia could be hypoxic and he could be to begin with irritable he is trying to breathe heavily by crying and uh, when he cries then you find that he is breathing better and he is trying to give more oxygen to himself but not realizing that when he is crying he is also oxygen demands are increasing so crying is not a good way to kind of counteract hypoxia developing so we need to be careful whether this child is developing any problem with gaseous exchange and we will have to be very careful about it similarly this child has a bronchitis so is there any ventilatory problem and if it is a ventilatory problem then a child could develop hypercarbia if he is developing hypercarbia then again he might be irritable so i am worried about this child's irritability as a symptom it might mean that this child should get oxygen or relieve any retention of carbon dioxide if any and we need to be very particular about treating this child not just with antibiotics but also with oxygenation and ensuring a good ventilation so this irritability and excessive crying is an important symptom in this child to analyze melvin let's have a next slide now nothing much on this okay uh, good go to the next fine uh, what do you mean by that there was one similar episode 8 months back okay sir recurrent so do you think it's a recurrent pneumonia or it's a recurrent bronchitis we said to begin with this child has got a bronchitis which became pneumonia so now the question is is this child having a recurrent bronchitis and a pneumonia was a complication or this was really a recurrent pneumonia again we would have got back to the same situation that somebody is saying bronchitis is yes we'll come to that okay but of the bronchitis starts with a cough any pneumonia starts with fever that's our yes. basic understanding look in medicine every time there may be an exception but the rule still holds good exceptions are rare 
So pneumonia starts with fever and not cough as a major symptom. So if this child last time also did the same, then we would have said this child has got a recurrent bronchitis, which gets complicated with a bacterial infection. So far, so good. Let's see the next slide, please. Okay, go further, go further. Nothing special on this, good. Nothing on this, nothing on this also. This is also all right. So now you show me your summary, fine. Yeah, read the summary. Yes, a uh, two-year-old uh, boy, uh, born of non-consanguineous marriage, birth order one, full-term normal vaginal delivery, belonging to class three of modified BG plus R classification, presence with cough since six days, fever since five days, and hurried breathing since three days. There uh, was a similar complaint eight months ago for which he was hospitalized and cured. Rest is normal. All right. Now, I think what is the idea of summarizing? Uh, you want to summarize the probable diagnosis. Okay. okay. This is okay. a short summary of the entire story. I agree. What is your interpretation out of it? So, who will try to give me the provisional diagnosis based on that? Uh, on the chat, contributing factors, all right? So, uh, we'll come to that too. Okay, treatment given. So, all, all those details could have come. But Melvin, now, uh, we have discussed so far the details of history. How do yes. you put your provisional diagnosis. Somebody is saying anatomical diagnosis is parenchyma, etiology is infection, maybe bacterial. Yes, but don't forget, we started saying that it is primarily a bronchial involvement. If the history is right, that the fever came later, but of course now on a summary, you seem to say that fever came the very next day. So if fever came the very next day, it could still be fever and cough together, but pneumonias don't cough badly. In fact, okay. in pneumonia, the fever is a presenting feature and a cough is a very minor event. But when the pneumonia starts improving, you start getting more and more cough because the entire liquefaction of a lesion the cough increases over time. So cough in an acute pneumonia is not a presenting feature significantly, but as he gets better, he may start having even cough. So we need to be very sure about that. I think what I'm trying to get to you is the history has to be so much in details that don't forget to ask the correct sequence of events. And in each symptom, give me origin, duration, progress. For example, did the cough go on increasing in severity? Did the fever go on increasing in its intensity? Did the breathlessness started getting worse day by day? Now, this is origin, duration, progress of each symptom. So, considering what we have discussed now, that let's keep up to say, this child had only cough to begin with for first two days. Fever came later. So it's like a bronchitis that became pneumonia. And recurrent bronchitis, yes, is so common for varieties of reasons. And I think we will possibly uh, summarize this as a two-year-old child came with an acute onset of severe cough, which was followed by fever and breathlessness, suggesting the disease proceeding to get infected and developing pneumonia with breathlessness. Past history suggests there was a similar story. And so this child may be having a recurrent bronchitis leading to infection rather than recurrent pneumonia. This is provided your history is perfect that there was only cough to begin with for first two days. 
and the fever came later. But if there was a fever and cough almost together, in which case the cough should not have been a significant symptom. There would have been a mild cough. In fact, patients with pneumonia rarely even complain of cough. They mainly complained of fever and then breathlessness. But you have to ask them whether there was also cough and they would say, yes, there was a mild cough. So how does pneumonia behave? High fever, a day or two later, breathlessness and mild cough. That's the sequence of a classical bacterial pneumonia. And what's the sequence of bronchitis becoming infected and causing pneumonia? The significant severe cough, then fever and then breathlessness. So look at how important is the story of a sequence of events. And I think take a very good look at this and therefore we will leave it at this. We have discussed both the probabilities. If fever was significant, cough was not, this is pneumonia. If cough was significant, fever came a little later, this was bronchial okay. disease of whatever origin and it would go getting infected. Now, having said that, before you go to clinical examination, tell me bronchitis is so common in the community. Even adults keep on getting bronchitis and you know that you have a chronic bronchitis and emphysema in an adult, the COPD, and in children also, bronchitis is very common. Uh, somebody on the chat says RSV, yes. But so what I mean is, Viral respiratory infections affect the airways as well as the entire respiratory system. So, respiratory syncytial virus, yes. So, bronchitis is caused by commonly viral infection, which could be recurrent, or it could be allergic, like hyperreactive airway, asthma, and therefore. Bronchitis in children is very common, largely two types. One, part of the viral infection. And second, part of allergy. And in children, we get what is known as a valerie. W-A-L-R-I. Now, what Measles is W-A-L-R-I? Wheezing associated. associated. Yeah, very good. So, yeah. that is triggered by the viral infection. What does it mean? You have a tendency for recurrent bronchitis, like an allergic bronchitis, which is triggered by virus. So look at the story of recurrent bronchitis. Either it could be viral recurrent bronchitis, or it could be recurrent allergic bronchitis, like an asthma, or it could be an hyperreactive airway, which is triggered by a viral infection, which is called valerie. So this child could have one of these three as a possibility, which possibly gets bacterially infected, or this child may have a pneumonia, as we said, if the story is a little different. <coughs> Let's at this point of time also discuss, suppose Melvin, this was really a recurrent pneumonia, and the story every time started with high fever, and the cough was not very severe. Then. Why should this child get recurrent pneumonia? Oh, you get my question. question. We said how this child can get recurrent bronchitis. Viral infection, allergic process, or a hyperreactive airway triggered by viral infection. One of the three. All three can have recurrent bronchitis. Okay. What's the reason why this child could get recurrent pneumonia? Any any thought on the chat? Uh, anatomical malformation. All right. Good. So immune system problem. Good. Okay. Now, in a two-year-old child, the classical mm -hmm. question that you ask for a possible immune deficiency is, how has he behaved with a live infection in the past? So now I'll just give you a tricky question. Okay. Does a two-year-old, healthy, normal child is exposed to live infection? 
all children two year old healthy in the community are mm-hmm. exposed to live infections how do they get exposed to live infections they are not suffering but they are exposed it's a tricky question i will give you an answer they get live vaccines so live vaccine is a live infection now tell me which are the live vaccines which a 2 year old must have got already mmr excellent okay any anything else and also bcg bcg okay so now in a 2 year old child we could have asked many questions to consider possibility of an immune dysfunction one have there been any significant serious infections of any other system probably not in this child second is how did this child respond to live vaccines so possibly the answer in this child may have been negative on the chat somebody is saying foreign body good foreign body can have a lost foreign body could cause infection and how is the good somebody is saying foreign body i want to ask you how do you differentiate recurrent infection caused by foreign body as against recurrent pneumonia caused by immune deficiency <coughs> any given thought difficult but get, let me give you a clue if foreign body is lost in one area the recurrent pneumonia are in the same lobe every time whereas in an immune deficiency it could be anywhere in the lung very good somebody is coming saying unilateral yes similarly if there was any congenital malformation in the lung again the recurrent pneumonia would be in the same lobe so we might like to find in this child whether the past story had a pneumonia and if so which part was involved and we will compare whether the same part is involved in this time in which case we would look for a foreign body or we could look for the congenital malformation right <coughs> so that the way we could have asked for a congenital malformation as a cause of recurrent pneumonia good and the third cause of recurrent pneumonia you said one is immune dysfunction second a localized abnormality like a foreign body or congenital malformation and a third is a mucociliary functional abnormality and very good somebody is saying celiac disease not simply celiac but you would have said cystic fibrosis or the immortal celia syndrome yes so these would be the reason but certainly not common so let's go now on clinical examination melvin take us ahead yes sir. a general physical examination uh, here is a child who is moderately built and moderately nourished he is conscious cooperative and well oriented to time place and person and sitting comfortably on the mother's lap during the examination now one minute here when did you examine this child in relation to breathlessness what i mean is he is already cooperative and fine which mean now he is not breathless so yes. i want to know within how much time he became normal so in the duration of the hospital stay that is 3 4 days so so his breathlessness was very quickly controlled yes sir. yes so now would you expect it to happen in bronchitis or in a pneumonia bronchitis yeah so again take a note okay if this child's breathlessness comes down very quickly maybe he was nebulized okay or he okay. got some bronchodilator but unlikely that in a very short time his breathlessness is controlled 
so that may be another point to make an impression that this could have been bronchitis to begin with and not pneumonia right go ahead yes. uh vitals pulse rate is 120 beats per minute regular rhythm normal volume uh, no radio radial radio femoral delay blood pressure is 90 by 50 mm of mercury uh, respiratory rate 50 breaths per minute uh temperature 101 degrees fahrenheit capillary filling time is 3 seconds and uh, no pallor ectrus clubbing cyanosis lymphadenopathy or edema now again here if he is breathing at 50 breaths per minute he is unlikely to be normal looking he is certainly tachypneic okay to be take a note so his breathlessness is not controlled what gave me an impression on the previous slide was he was much normal but he is still tachypneic okay go further go ahead anthropometry is normal sir very good go ahead a uh, head to toe examination no abnormalities good go ahead a uh, respiratory system examination a yeah. uh, upper respiratory tract there is flaring of the nasal ala nasal septum is normal uh, air sinuses are normal no tenderness is felt oropharynx appears to be normal no uh, enlargement of the tonsils pharynx posterior wall seems to be congested All right, just wait a minute here now. What yeah. does flaring of nasal ala mean to you? So movement with the uh, every breath. So it it means that there is some extra effort of breathing. Extra effort. So yeah. possibly there is an increased work of breathing and right accessory muscle of respiration. Yes, somebody on the chat says. would you also talk about the type of breathing etc but i suppose you will come on that so on this slide tell me why is this child's posterior wall of pharynx congested we are talking about pneumonia hmm. so what does that mean uh, pharyngitis is so it means possibly we are we are not going only by that we will take a entire global view of this problem but if there is some evidence of pharyngitis it appears that this child also has upper and lower airway involved to begin with in the history we said only lower airway but there may have been also part of upper airway involved and most often viral bronchitis or allergic bronchitis or a valry they have possibly entire airway involved upper and lower both so this could be that somebody on the chat says retropharyngeal problem so retropharyngeal problem really comes with difficulty in swallowing drooling of saliva and breathlessness not only just the posterior wall uh, congestion so possibly not a retropharyngeal disease right so here we get two information one work of breathing seems to be increased there is 50 uh, breaths per minute so there is a definite tachypnea and pharynx is also involved so our impression that airway is involved seems to be right next slide uh inspection shape of the chest is normal movements are decreased on the right side Uh, trachea appears to be at the center both the nipples are at the same level the pycal beat is not seen subcostal and intercostal retractions are seen and there is the use of accessory muscles no scar sinus dilated vein no drooping of the shoulder or crowding of the rib fine now you said decreased on the right side you think all over the right side or only some part of the right side that is important okay so what difference does it make suppose i tell you right side only anteriorly and not posteriorly or only posteriorly not anteriorly does it make a difference yes sir what is the difference uh, localization of the lobe yes so 
Tushar is saying lobe of the lung. Good. So who will tell me the surface anatomy of the right lung? Surface anatomy. This is what clinicians should use. So what's the surface anatomy? Any any one who can. I'm sure you are only three years down the line after anatomy. Okay. Upper chest, upper lobe. Very good. Good. Go ahead. Where is the middle lobe? Middle lobe, middle chest. All right. And where is the lower lobe? Yeah. A bit, bit change. Good. The on the right side there are three lobes: upper, middle, and lower. So upper half anteriorly is the upper lobe. Then. Lower half anteriorly is the middle lobe, and posterior lobe is only posteriorly. The lower lobe is only posterior. So, if the finding see pneumonia is generally lobar, and if it's yeah. a lobar pneumonia, then upper lobe right side pneumonia should have signs only anteriorly in upper half. If it is the middle lobe pneumonia, sign should be only anteriorly in the lower half, and if it is a lower lobe pneumonia, sign should be only posteriorly and nothing anteriorly. Now this is surface anatomy, but who will tell me what happens in the axilla? I told you anterior and posterior. How are they placed in the axilla? Excellent. Somebody saying. All three lobes. So let's say two, three intercostal spaces in the axilla, upper lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe. So not easy to make out because one can easily overlap the other, and therefore you must know surface anatomy well to tell me whether the signs are localized to the lobe. This is known as. Lobar distribution of clinical signs. Lobar distribution. Now, at this age, this discussion, let me ask you a question: What is plural distribution of clinical signs? I told you what is lobar distribution. What is plural distribution? Very good. So, plural distribution is all over. Anterior axilla posteriorly, below a particular level of intercostal space. So, if there is a moderate pleural effusion, you will get signs in the lower half, anteriorly, lower half axilla, lower half posteriorly, all over. And this is pleural distribution because pleura is covering entire part of the lung, and therefore. You have a plural distribution, which is all over anterior, posterior, and axilla, whereas the lobar distribution is related to a surface anatomy. And why do you think the pneumonia should be only localized to one lobe generally, but pleural effusion is all over? Why is this difference? Why should pneumonia involve entire lung? Excellent. Tushar is saying there are fissures. Fissures are the natural boundaries where the nature will try to restrict spread of infection from one lobe to another. It happens rarely that you get multiple areas of pneumonias. It means either you have some abnormalities of host, and again uh, the right answer is there. These are limitation limiting. Fissures, which don't allow infection to spread for one, but in pleura that doesn't happen. But don't you get a localized pleural effusion? Localized pleural effusion. So cystic, uh, uh, cystic lesion. No, but why should pleural effusion be localized to call cystic? Excellent. I think Tushar is coming out saying it's a septi that are developed. 
so to sir when does a pleural effusion develop septa hai so septa are develop only long standing so partial treatment and what is important if you saw septi in a pleural effusion on an ultrasound then drainage is not easy adhesion yes so pleural effusion is rarely localized unless it is partially treated and not correctly treated right so go go to the next slide Uh, palpation. All inspectory findings are confirmed. No tenderness. No local rise of temperature. Position of trachea is central. Spiral impulse felt in the uh, fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line. Uh, chest expansion is decreased on the right side. Vocal fremitus could not be elicited. Okay. At this point, let me ask you a question. Normally, you know that trachea could be even slightly to the right. Yes. Correct. Now. if that is so in this child then trachea centrally shifted to the left oh yes so how do you tell me that this trachea is not shifted to the left and it was originally also in the center you get a quite little tricky yeah, question but i think you are also good students so i don't want to ask you a simple question i want to sensitize your gray cells fishia yeah i want to know how in this child you rule out a trachea shifted slightly to the left because originally it was slightly to the right some better answer so the answer is you have to go by other clinical signs of pull or push if there is no pull or push in this child then this trachea is normal for this child okay it's only when there is a pull or a push that the trachea is shifted so if this child had a trachea slightly to the right to begin with and now it is shifted to the left there has to be something pushing from the right or pulling from the left and you have no evidence of collapse or fibrosis on the left or a pleural effusion or a pneumothorax on the right so this trachea is normal for this child so that much is right now tell me what does this vocal fremitus is low right decrease what does it mean to you uh, so there is some obstruction obstruction where bronchial obstruction so why should somebody saying congestion no give me a better answer somebody says effusion all right and yeah but now tell me effusion is right answer what about pneumonia does pneumonia have a reduced vr or an increased vr increased vr very good oh somebody says reduce no pneumonia has an increased vr and an effusion has a decreased vr okay but now tell me fluid is a good conductor of sound that much i know by physics fluid is a good conductor of sound then in a pleural effusion why should vr or tvf be decreased excellent Tushar is again saying that there is in between the bronchus and the fluid there is a collapsed lung in between. So when the sound reaches to the collapsed lung in between, the sound is dampened and the fluid doesn't get that sound. So in fluid being a good conductor of sound, even then in pleural effusion, the tvf and vr is decreased good so now tell me uh, melvin why do you write that vocal fremitus could not be elicited so you could you could at least look at vocal resonance i thought right 
Yes, sir. Because child is crying all the time. You don't have to have a child say one, two, three, or ninety-nine. Crying is good enough. Okay, it's a ready-made sound. Anyway, let's look at the next slide. Ah, uh, the question. Yes. Ah, uh, there is dullness on the right side, mammary, inframammary, axillary, infraxillary, and infracapillar uh, regions. Okay. So now that is not looking Melvin like a pneumonia. Okay, that I am little worried because there is no low bar distribution. Okay, but anyway, I think uh, on a digital platform we cannot look at your clinical signs whether they are right or wrong. But let's let's not worry about that. Okay, so now tell me, somebody is writing woody dull or stony dull. Now, what is this difference in dullness? i call somebody dull i don't say he is stony dull okay so who would tell me what is the difference between stony dull stony with pain all right painful percussion is not stony woody without pain and stony with pain no so point i am making is now i think you are all very bright student so you don't call dull as stony dull or not stony dull it's all impaired note okay it's a dull note what i'm trying to say is that don't use stony dull for a fluid and only dull for a pneumonia no that is a dullness on the part of a doctor dullness is dullness now when a candidate tells me it's a stony or a woody dull i always have asked him which stone has he percussed to know what is stony dull and which wood did he percuss to know woody dull oh we never so forget about that this is just to make you understand that you have three types of percussion notes normal resonant hyper resonant or impaired that's enough well it's fine to say stony dull for effusion but not a good idea okay tympanic that is hyper resonant normal resonant and impaired right so okay melvin your distribution is worrying me it is like a pleural disease but let's not bother about it i think on our digital platform teaching we want to give you messages you will have to try to develop the clinical skills of examination on your own okay and the best way is percuss normal chest very often and i'm sure in the world there are so many patients who have no respiratory diseases you percuss their chest to know what is normal see uh, generally on examination we don't give attention to what is normal for knowing how does an abnormal liver look like you must palpate 100 normal livers and you have enough normal livers in your ward only few abnormal livers but you focus on abnormal liver but before that so i think you spend one day each on normal examination of your ward patient who do not have that system affection i think it will teach you a lot what is a normal yeah. liver like what is a normal chest percussion like right go ahead yeah, so go next um auscultation it's same the bron bronchial in mammary inframammary axillary infraxillary and infrascapular very good so again we will take a note of the distribution Yeah, some network problem is there. It seems from uh, Shwant Na Amde Kar Sir. You must be one of the better students in your class. Okay, and confident one. Oh, so you must.
can you hear me yes sir yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so uh, melvin go ahead doesn't matter okay the rest of the systems are normal yes sir all right so now give your final diagnosis uh two year old uh, boy with lower respiratory tract infection most probably severe pneumonia affecting the lower lobes all right so i'm sure with our discussion <coughs> now you will know two thing a lower respiratory tract is a wide anatomy it includes yeah. bronchi it includes bronchioles it can include lung parenchyma it includes pleura <coughs> so we will not call any time now lower respiratory tract infection it's a general term and we will give a micro anatomy like a pneumonia and which lobe anyway i think we have discussed uh, how clinical findings are not gelling well but that's not important you have learned the pneumonia have a low bar distribution and a pleural disease has a pleural distribution okay and just to complete this before we go to investigation and treatment is there any non low bar and non pleural distribution non low bar non pleural neither this nor that and that means the lesion is very weird that could happen in any cyst anywhere or any mediastinal mass obstructing some areas so that's rare so you can also have a non low bar non pleural distribution which means there is something funny happening everywhere in the mediastinum okay uh, melvin how would you investigate this child and no, show yes. me the test if you have done no sir no sir okay doesn't matter tell me what investigation would you do so uh, we will do the uh, the routine investigations like the blood investigation yes. uh, complete And blood count hemoglobin very good i'm uh -huh. sure uh, most of the student do use a uh, routine test yes you are not wrong but what is routine in investigation there is no routine okay yes. you don't have to do cbc on every child admitted in your ward okay it is routine yes so best way is to say that you would have done a complete blood count okay and why do you want a complete blood count is wbc and differential not enough you're right you want cbc can you do only the wbc and differential count that's my interest in pneumonia oh somebody is saying you want to know eosinophils also yes all right but what is important is every child in our country is also anemic mm. you are not treating only pneumonia you are treating this two year old child so every child should have a cbc okay and should every cbc also include peripheral smear yes or no need you are not looking at malaria so why do you need a peripheral smear So peripheral smear tells you the type of anemia. Excellent. And you want to pick up a peripheral smear as well. You might see a lymphocytic response in the peripheral smear. You might see a typical lymphocytes suggestive of a viral infection. You might see a lot of shift to the left, yes, indicating a polymorphonuclear leukocytosis, and therefore. you would certainly look at the cbc now uh, somebody says sputum examination yes in an adult you will typically do a sputum examination but my child 2 year old cannot give you a sputum so possibly you might not get sputum but yes what you are trying to say is that it's important to get a bacteriological diagnosis if possible we said most of the pneumonia patient don't cough badly so even in an older child or an adult it's not easy to get a sputum in a pneumonia unless he could expectorate with a great pressure and bring out a little small amount of sputum 
which is still possible in a older child or an adult but not easy uh, in a child of pneumonia fine so you have done cbc uh, you expect a neutrophilic leukocytosis and uh, somebody on the chat said eosinophils what is the importance of eosinophils allergic allergic bronchitis allergy yes so uh, also in an acute infection both bacterial and viral generally eosinophils are suppressed and often zero and to that extent a uh, suppressed in eosinophils are seen in acute infection and increased eosinophils may mean parasitic infection or allergy as was put down by some students on chat yes so we'll look at that then would you do an ultrasound or would you do a chest x ray chest x ray and not an ultrasound so mm. when would you do an ultrasound in a child of pneumonia chest x ray yes any any idea about very good sir says ultrasound to pick up even small amount of fluid ultrasound is a good sensitive investigation to pick up any fluid and in a younger child we are worried whether he would develop an empyema the infection will quickly spread in a small child and younger the child of pneumonia you would also possibly pick up a small amount of fluid in an ultrasound it might indicate in a given situation of high fever and a sick child that already an empyema is developing and you might have to act aggressively to treat this child's empyema so when it is chest x ray would you do a uh, what view of a chest x ray would you like do you want only a pa or an ap view or you want a lateral view also so when do you want a lateral view in a child of pneumonia fine so lateral view gives you a clear idea of which lobe is involved whereas if it's a typical upper or a middle lobe you can easily confirm by a pa view and therefore uh, at times in case of doubt you might do a lateral view to see exactly which lobe is involved do you want to do a ct scan on this child no who will answer whether somebody says no tell me why no you are right so ct scan is a better idea no affordability all right but suppose i have enough money then would you do won't affect the treatment yes so what it means is that ct scan does not give any more information to me in most of the case of pneumonia having said that what is the reason for doing a ct scan in a pneumonia like condition so ct scan may pick up if there are any caseating lymph nodes if it is a suspected to be a tuberculous pneumonia but we are not looking at tuberculous pneumonia somebody also says calcification which could also be made out on a chest x ray but yes so point is ct scan in a pneumonia is almost never required but yes if you are confused with a small retrocardiac shadow you are not able to place correctly in which part of the lung or outside the lung it is then you might do a ct scan but in a classical pneumonia there is no reason for asking for a ct scan at all having said that let's discuss in last 5 minutes how would you treat this child so supportive management with oxygen yes and nutritional support all right um, somebody says to... he will give macrolide now tell me why macrolide somebody says empirical antibiotic right so two good questions let they be answered 
uh, why macrolide? So why should you give macrolide in a pneumonia? And in which pneumonia you could consider macrolide as the first probable thing? Somebody says ampicillin is the treatment of choice. Yes, amoxicillin or ampicillin would be the treatment of choice based on empirical antibiotic therapy. And what is this based on? Based on a common epidemiology. Any child two years and above is likely to have most common gram-positive infection bacteria, and they are very well covered with amoxicillin or ampicillin. Today, amoxicillin is preferred antibiotic even to ampicillin, and there is no reason specifically to have clavulinic acid added to amoxicillin. But today, everywhere in the market, amoxic clavulinic combination is more often easily available than amoxicillin alone. And therefore, you are right if you say amoxic clav or amoxicillin, and that is fine. That is basically. But tell me, oh, somebody is saying mycoplasma pneumonia, you give macrolide. Very correct. <coughs> but now the question to you is, how do you judge clinically that it could be mycoplasma? Cloxacillin, yes. Cloxacillin is a good drug for a staphylococcal disease, especially if it is not MRSA. But clinically, you cannot make out of that. Uh, somebody is saying baby is able to walk in a mycoplasma. <coughs> what does it mean? Mycoplasma pneumonia is an atypical pneumonia. And what is atypical? There are two atypicalities in a mycoplasma pneumonia. One atypicality is what the person on a chat has said. The child is able to walk. What does it mean? Child does not look sick even in presence of pneumonia. That is atypical because a child of acute pneumonia is sick. But a child of mycoplasma acute pneumonia is likely to be not sick. So proportionately, he is well. That is one atypicality. And what is another atypicality? This mycoplasma pneumonia coughs badly. Cough is a severe symptom in a mycoplasma pneumonia. And why is it so? Because mycoplasma also involves airway. So mycoplasma is an airway and a lung parenchymal involvement, almost like what viral pneumonia looks like. But viral pneumonia is not common. But mycoplasma pneumonia is common in a little older children, school going children, older children. But mycoplasma pneumonia is suspected because of two atypical features, proportionately well child in spite of pneumonia and pneumonia having bad cough. <coughs> so I think that is what it is. Lastly, uh, Melvin, tell me what should be the prognosis of this child? Mm. You are mute. Good. Somebody is saying good. on the chat, good. Yes. And uh, tell me, good. How you have three symptoms in this child. Cough, fever, and breathlessness. Now, when you start treatment, which of these three symptoms will disappear first? Which will disappear second? And which will be the last to disappear? Fever will disappear first. Fever will disappear first? Cough will disappear first? Oh, somebody is rightly giving a sequence. Breathlessness will come down first. Tachypnea will start coming down. Then fever will start going down. And the cough will be the last to disappear. In fact, cough may be even a little more severe during a stage of evolution, of a resolution. And therefore, it's also important in clinical management that you anticipate the progress of events. Because <coughs> if the shell continues to be breathless, but the fever disappears first, that means 
against our sequence does it mean anything to you you get my question somebody on the chat rightly gave me the sequence breathless to disappear first fever next and cough the last now suppose in my child fever disappears first and the child is still breathless what must have happened <coughs> which means child may have gone into shock because of shock child is cold you take an axillary temperature the child is not low but if you take a rectal temperature the child may be very high doesn't happen commonly but what i want you to know is that in good clinical practice a treating physician must also anticipate the sequence of events on good treatment and tell the parents what is expected to happen and if the sequence of events of expectation goes astray the parents must report to you immediately and i think this is important to learn and therefore we will end up today with few messages one you have learned cough fever breathlessness the sequence of events are important you have learned cough as a significant symptom is an airway symptom and not a parenchyma symptom yes saline nebulization somebody is saying yes you have also learned lobar distribution of signs as against plural distribution of signs now you have also learned to learn sequence of progression on treatment and if anticipated progression does not happen that's a complication and don't forget even to take a note of it right good yes. so i think we will end up today's discussion uh, melvin i was very happy you gave a good presentation and i am also very happy that you had uh, several uh, students coming on the chat giving their opinion but i would request the uh, management of white army that i may prefer a five or six or even more willing student to come on the screen so that we can have a discussion face to face which is much better which is much lively and which is which i can read even your gestures or face as you talk and i would know whether you are very confident so i hope the uh, people managing white army uh, take a note of my request if possible and today on digital platform it's so easy last time i had a few students on the screen which meant a very good lively discussion even today the discussion was good but it's nice to say see the person who is discussing that gives you a lot of different ways of knowing right good yes, sir. We, totally we will agree sir yeah yeah uh, uh, thank you very please. much yes, and sir. thank you sir i thank all the students uh, don't forget uh, it teaches me also how to teach and many times i also learn new things from students so i am waiting to learn more and more from you because you are all reading a lot i don't read so much and i go only by what i remember and you know i am almost 80 years now so i am senile okay my memory goes down so i want to re refresh my memory by looking at you by listening to you so you are also helping me to learn thank you very much and thank you thank aishwarya you. for getting me on this and yeah. next time wherever i come you might have some more students on the screen yes, yeah sir. thank you very much thank you thank you sir. very much it was a great session uh, it was indeed a comprehensive clinical class thank you so much professor yk amdekar sir for teaching and guiding us we are thank ever you. you need your blessings guidance and support throughout it was a great effort by the presenter mr melvin mabin we could learn a lot because of your well prepared presentation we also Absolutely. thank all the participants who were enthusiastically answering and were actively involved thank you one and all and aishwarya people like you are really taking a lead in 
disseminating knowledge. So I must congratulate you because without you, we could not be here. And it's important that you are there. Well, we are also incidentally there. Thank you very much for being there. Yeah. Thank you, sir.